Chapter 41 The Bosworth Connection The year was 1948 William Branham spent December of 1947 at his home in Jeffersonville, Indiana, trying to rest and regain his strength. At the same time, he was praying for God to show him where he should go next. Ever since he met that angel in the Tunnel Mill Wilderness, the leading of the Holy Spirit had become stronger in his life, sometimes prompting him to do things he would never have considered doing if he was just using his rational mind. One afternoon, he received a phone call from a doctor who told him that Elijah B. had just died at home. Elijah B. was a friend of Bill's. He was a Christian man who occasionally came to Branham Tabernacle to hear Bill preach. Bill went over to Elijah's house to offer his sympathy to the family. By the time he got there, the doctor had already left. Elijah's body was still lying on the bed in the bedroom where he had died. The doctor had spread a white sheet over him. Mrs. B. and several of her friends sat in the living room, stunned and grieving. Bill talked to Mrs. B. about Elijah's faith in Jesus and how her husband was now in a better place. After sharing a few comforting scripture verses and praying for Mrs. B., he said goodbye. As he walked out the front door, he felt somebody grab his arm from behind. It felt like a solid human hand with a firm grip, a grip strong enough to stop him in the middle of his stride. But when he turned to see who it was, there was nobody there. A shiver ran down his spine. Now he knew the angel of the Lord did not want him to leave this house just yet. He returned to the living room. Mrs. B. asked him if he had forgotten something, but he ignored her. He walked straight past her and entered the bedroom where Elijah's body lay limp and stiffening under that white sheet. Kneeling beside the bed, Bill started to pray. At first he didn't know why he was there, so he didn't know exactly what he should say. Soon the Holy Spirit took over his prayer and he was barely conscious of what he was saying or doing. A half hour later he realized he had stretched his body on top of the dead man's body so that his face and Elijah's face were only separated by that thin cotton fabric. Bill was crying out to the spirit world, Brother Elijah, Brother Elijah, where are you, Brother Elijah? Somehow searching for Elijah's departed spirit. Suddenly he felt a hand grab his ear. Bill jerked his head up just enough to see who it was. The hand that had touched him came from the man who was under the sheet. Quickly, Bill slid off the bed and pulled back the sheet. Elijah opened his eyes and smiled. Bill called for Mrs. B., who came into the bedroom. Instantly, her tears of sorrow turned into tears of joy. A few days after his resurrection, Elijah B. returned to work at his job with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Bill continued to pray for God to show him where he should go next. In mid-January of 1948, William Branham got a telephone call from little David Walker, the teenage preacher he had met in Long Beach, California, ten months earlier. Hello, Brother Branham. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. I've just started two weeks of revival meetings here, and it's not working out. Oh, what's wrong? I've got a tent that will hold about 2,500 people, but so far just a handful of people are coming out each night. It's embarrassing. That's odd. Knowing how skillfully this boy could preach, it surprised Bill that little David's meetings were so poorly attended. Do you have any idea what's keeping folks away? I think it's jealousy and suspicion among the church leaders down here. As soon as they heard I was coming, every church in town suddenly had their own boy preacher. It's hard to believe but every day there are two full pages in the Miami paper advertising all the boy preachers holding revivals. They must be afraid that if some of their people come out to hear me, they might lose them. That's a shame, Bill said. He knew how petty jealousies could plague church leaders. It's too bad Christians can't pull closer together in the love of Christ. It certainly is. Little David paused, then came to the reason for his call. Brother Branham... Could you come to Miami and help me out? Bill remembered that March night in Long Beach when this boy evangelist had done him a favor. 
Sure, I'll come. Taking the next train south, Bill settled in for a long trip. While passing through Tennessee, he sensed the angel of the Lord drawing near. The hair on the back of Bill's neck prickled with fear. Despite the many times he had met this angel in the past 21 months, Bill could just not get used to its supernatural presence. His terror mellowed as he felt himself moving into a vision. The hubbub of passengers diminished and the clicking of the train wheels faded away. Soon the passenger car disappeared completely. Bill found himself standing in a hilly country, green with tall cedars and scattered with rocks that lapped over each other in long slabs. His attention was drawn to a young boy, between eight and ten years old, who lay crumpled and motionless on the side of the road. The boy looked dead. Bill walked close enough to see the boy's features. A flat nose, brown eyes, brown hair cut raggedly as though trimmed by unskilled hands. He was shabbily dressed in foreign-looking clothes, knee socks and knickerbockers, with big brass buttons high up on his waist. There must have been an accident because the boy's face was scuffed and disfigured, and his clothes were torn. One shoe was still laced on his foot, but the other was missing. Bill couldn't see any signs of life. While Bill stood there wondering what it all meant, the angel of the Lord moved up beside him on his right. The angel asked, Can the boy live? Bill answered, Sir, I do not know. Now the angel stepped into view, showing Bill how he should kneel over the lifeless form and how he should lay his hands across the boy when he prayed for him. In a moment, the boy's lungs filled with air and he sat up. At this point, the vision ended. Suddenly, Bill was back in his seat on the train rolling through Tennessee. Soon after Bill arrived in Miami, little David shared with him the morning paper. An advertisement was framed in the top corner of one page announcing the coming of Reverend William Branham to hold five days of healing services in the city. The rest of the page was crowded with larger, flashier advertisements announcing other healing services in local churches. Little David sighed. It happened the day after I placed the first advertisement about your coming. As soon as they read it, all the denominations in town suddenly found someone to preach divine healing in their own churches. I wish they knew that we're not here to start a new group, Bill commented. We're only here to help them further the cause of Christ. Despite these attempts by local churches to undermine his appeal, the name William Branham had developed a magnetism of its own. When Bill arrived for his first meeting that night, he found the tent half full of curious onlookers. Bill greeted the people. Then, before he brought up the subject of healing, he described the vision he had seen while traveling through Tennessee. Bill urged the crowd to write it down on the flyleaf of your Bible. Then you watch and see. That boy will be raised from the dead by the power of Jesus Christ. I don't know where or when it will happen, but it will happen because it is thus saith the Lord. And after it happens, we'll put it in the new magazine that Brother Lindsay is going to put out. Gordon Lindsay, still excited by the potential of Bill's unique ministry, had already lent his managerial skills to the cause. Lindsay suggested that Bill could use a full-time assistant to set up meetings and tend to the many details of a campaign, allowing Bill to concentrate on praying for the sick. The success of Bill's Pacific Northwest tour arranged by Lindsay proved the value of this idea. However, Lindsay didn't want the job himself, at least not full-time. He had another ambition. Gordon Lindsay was starting a magazine that would be the official publication of the Branham campaigns, printing articles about past meetings and publicizing upcoming events, as well as printing testimonies from those who had been healed. Lindsay planned to call this magazine The Voice of Healing. As soon as Bill had agreed to the idea, Lindsay had started working towards publication. The first monthly issue of The Voice of Healing magazine was due out in about two months. The first night in Miami, a hundred people passed through the prayer line. Faith mounted when the audience saw Bill reveal diseases through the gift in his hand. Most cases were healed, and some outstanding miracles took place, including two young boys born blind, who both received their sight. An account of these two miracles circulated in the morning newspaper, 
That sparked the interest of a local radio station, and both boys were invited down to the studio for a live interview. With unabashed zeal, these two children testified about the healing power of Jesus Christ. That primed the public's interest, some with curiosity, some with excitement, and others with skepticism. One radio listener in particular had a sprinkle of all three emotions. Reverend Fred Bosworth knew firsthand the power of Christ to heal, having preached on the subject many times over the past 40 years. In the 1920s, Bosworth held large revival meetings in dozens of American cities, compelling sinners to repent and urging Christians to believe God for the healing of their ailments. His energetic style and orderly presentation proved so successful that after one 1924 meeting in Ottawa, Canada, an estimated 12,000 people sought salvation in the mercy of Jesus. Then the Great Depression curtailed his evangelistic ministry. As incomes withered in the 1930s, it grew harder to finance these large revival campaigns. Retreating from the field, Fred Bosworth became a pioneer of radio evangelism, establishing the National Radio Revival Missionary Crusade. He also wrote two books, Christian Confession and Christ the Healer. Later he retired and moved to Florida. Now 71, Fred Bosworth had been out of active ministry for several years. He thought that all he wanted in life now was a succession of lazy, carefree days. When he heard these two boys give their testimonies on the radio, it aroused his interest. Born blind, and now they could see? Over the years, Fred Bosworth had seen many miracles. The dumb speak, the deaf hear, cripples walk, cancers disappear. In fact, he had received over 200,000 written testimonies from people who had been healed under his ministry. But never had he seen or heard about people born blind receiving their sight. Who was this man, William Branham? Was he a shyster? Or was the Spirit of God moving in a way that he had never seen before? Bosworth felt curious, and he had to admit a bit excited. Maybe he should check it out. Reverend Fred Bosworth was not alone in his desire to investigate. For the rest of that week, more people came to Bill's meetings than could be crammed inside the tent. Many turned around and went home, but thousands more stood outside the tent, hoping for a chance to get into the prayer line. With so many people wanting prayer, Bill decided not to use the gift of discernment in his hand. It worked too slowly. Instead, he had the people go by him in a fast line, so that he could just lay his hands on them and offer a quick prayer as they passed by. On the last night of this Miami revival, before the service got underway, little David came to Bill and said, There is a father back there causing a commotion. His son drowned this morning in an irrigation ditch. The father has been all week in the meetings and heard you tell the vision about a little boy being raised from the dead. Now he wonders if that vision was about his son. He's seen enough miracles this week to believe it could happen and won't let the undertaker touch his son until you take a look at him. I'll be happy to go and see him, said Bill. Making his way to where the father grieved, it took just one glimpse for Bill to know. He told the father, I'm sorry, but this is not the one. The boy I saw in the vision had ragged brown hair and looked to be about eight to ten years old. Your son has neatly cut black hair and couldn't be more than five, and your son is too well dressed. The boy in the vision was dressed real poor. Besides, your son is drowned. The boy I saw in the vision was all mashed up like he had been in an accident. I'm sorry, sir, but all I can do here is pray for the consolation of the family. That last night in Miami, there were so many people desiring a touch from God that Bill formed a prayer line for a breast so that both he and little David could pray for people at the same time, he on one side of the line and little David on the other. Amidst the mass and pull of hundreds jostling by him, Bill noticed a pitiful young girl being helped through the line by an older woman. The girl struggled along with heavy braces on her legs that came all the way up to her waist. Taking a moment to hold the girl's hand as she passed by, Bill felt the demonic vibrations of polio. He also perceived that this girl did not yet have enough faith to be healed. Pulling the girl aside, Bill said, 
Honey, you stand right behind me and pray that God will increase your faith. The crippled girl did as she was asked to do, holding on to Bill's coattail while she bowed her head and prayed. Bill turned his attention back to the prayer line. After a while, he sensed the girl's faith beginning to rise like a heartbeat. Ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. He turned around and said, Now, sweetheart, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke this demon that's got you bound. Satan, come out of her. Looking at the older woman who stood beside the girl, Bill ordered, Help her take off those braces. The woman looked horrified. But, Brother Branham, she can't stand on her own. Lady, don't you doubt. You just do what I told you to do. The woman swallowed hard, obviously worried, but she unlaced the braces anyway. Soon a shrill scream pierced the din of the crowd. Bill turned to see this once crippled girl holding her leg braces above her head and striding back and forth across the platform as gracefully as any child had ever walked. That was a miracle nobody in the tent could miss. The people's faith skyrocketed and they eagerly touched Bill as they passed by. Bill prayed for as many as he could, as fast as he could. In a few minutes, he sensed another specific pull of faith. He kept turning his head, looking for the source. Then he spotted it. Moving back to the microphone, Bill said, Sir, you weigh in the back. Fourth seat from the aisle. The man with the white shirt on. I can sense your faith from clear up here. Stand up. Jesus Christ has healed you. The man stood, raising his arms above his head at the same time. But as soon as his hands reached their full height, he jerked them down and stared at one arm in surprise. Then he shouted. That brought up the woman sitting next to him. Looking at the man's arm, she too demonstrated her surprise, throwing up her arms and shouting excitedly. Bill turned his attention back to the prayer line. Fred Bosworth got up from his seat and made his way to the back of the tent. When the man who had just been healed finally quieted down, Bosworth asked, Sir, I'm a minister of the gospel, and I was wondering if you would tell me what happened. The man thrust out his hand. Look at this. It looks like an ordinary hand to me, said Bosworth. It is normal. That's the miracle. A few years ago, I fell off a horse and landed on this hand. Ever since then, it has been crippled and useless, until now. He moved his fingers energetically to illustrate how well they worked. Bosworth asked, Why didn't you go through the prayer line like the others? I came here tonight as a critic. The longer I watched, the more I believed that God could perform miracles. When I saw that girl take off her braces, I knew God could heal my withered hand too. Bosworth threaded his way up to the front, got Bill's attention, and said, Reverend Branham, I'm a minister of the gospel, and I want to ask you a question. How did you know that man back there had enough faith to be healed? All of a sudden, I felt weaker, Bill explained. I knew someone's faith was drawing hard on the gift, so I began to look around. It seemed like all my focus was drawn to that man. Fred Bosworth clapped his hands in amazement. That is exactly what happened to Jesus when the woman with the blood issue touched his garment. He said he felt virtue go out of him. Virtue is strength. May I say something to the crowd? Go right ahead. Stepping over to the microphone, Bosworth shared the miracle with everyone, adding, That proves Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gift that was in Jesus Christ would be like this whole Atlantic Ocean out there beating against the beach. The gift that is in our brother would be like a spoonful of water taken out of the ocean, but the same chemicals and minerals that are in the ocean would also be in this spoonful. The next evening, Fred Bosworth and Bill ate supper together at the hotel. Bosworth told Bill about some of the miracles he had seen during his 40 years of ministry. Yet in all my years, he remarked, I never saw anything like that meeting last night. So Bill shared with this elderly minister how the angel of the Lord had met him in 1946 and commissioned him to take a gift of divine healing to the people of the world. He explained the sign in his hand, how he could discern many illnesses through the vibrations caused by the demonic life of the diseases, which would cause his hand to swell and would produce a pattern of white bumps on the back of his hand. 
Suddenly, Fred Bosworth forgot about his retirement. Brother Branham, would you have any use for my expertise? I would love to travel with you and help you out wherever I could. Brother Bosworth, I would be honored to have your company. I've been praying about getting a manager. Leaving the hotel, they strolled along the beach, talking about the second coming of Christ. The sun was setting behind the beachfront hotels. Frothy waves licked at the two men's feet. Bill noticed a spring in Fred Bosworth's step, so different from his own dragging footsteps. Bill felt exhausted, even though he had slept well into the day. It seemed like he could barely lift his feet out of the sand. He asked, Brother Bosworth, how old are you? Seventy-one. When were you at your best? Right now, Brother Branham. I'm just a kid living in an old house. Bill envied such vigor. Here he was at 38, nearly dead from fatigue. What was dragging him down so low? In March, Bill was scheduled to be in Phoenix again, this time for a healing campaign that would last all week. The day he arrived in the city, Bill mentioned his chronic fatigue to the pastor who was sponsoring these meetings. Brother Branham, the pastor said, Your trouble is that you are too sincere. After you pray for God's children, you should just forget about them. After all, it's God's business whether the people accept their healing or not. I didn't know I could be too sincere about the work of the Lord, Bill remarked. I thought the more sincere I was, the better God could use me. Well, if you keep up this pace, the pastor warned, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Bill drove out into the desert to pray. Heavenly Father, how come I get so weak? Other ministers don't have this problem. Brother Bosworth told me he kept up a pace like mine for years and it never bothered him. Maybe he's got more of the Holy Ghost than I've got. If that's my problem, then please, Lord, give me more of the Holy Spirit so I can hold up better. He paused, staring out across the miles of desert filled with prickly pear cacti, palo verde and mesquite trees. In the distance, rugged mountains jutted up abruptly from the flat desert floor. As Bill listened, he seemed to hear God speaking to him, not audibly, but in his thoughts, saying, Those men depend on their own faith and preach by their word. Your strength is being drained by a supernatural gift. Suddenly, certain scriptures sprang to life in his understanding. He remembered how the prophet Daniel saw a vision and was physically troubled by it for many days. Bill also recalled Fred Bosworth's comment about the woman who was healed when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus said he felt virtue go out of him. That afternoon, when Bill drove out of the desert, his body still teetered on the edge of collapse, but at least now he understood why. During his second night in Phoenix, as the prayer line approached its end, Bill took the hand of a heavy-set woman. At first, he couldn't interpret the vibrations he felt. You've either got cancer or female trouble. They both hit almost alike. Just a minute, it's female trouble. Is that right? It's almost to a cancer. Life hasn't been a flowery bed of ease for you. No, you've had a lot of toil. But tonight, Jesus Christ can lift your burdens if you'll believe it. Next in line came a well-dressed middle-aged man. Bill took the man's hand. Sir, I don't feel any vibrations. Whatever your trouble is, it's not caused by a germ. The man wept. Brother Branham, I guess I've played the part of a hypocrite by coming in the prayer line when I'm not sick. But it was the only way I knew how to get to you. I hear you're a poor man. I want to give you a little offering. He held out a check. Bill gently pushed the check away. I don't receive offerings. Look, I just want to show my gratitude to the Lord. Last night I brought my wife through the prayer line in a wheelchair. After you prayed for her, she walked for the first time in 16 years. But I never healed her, Bill insisted. Jesus Christ healed her. Well, I'm an oil man from Texas, and I wrote out this $25,000 check in your name. Taking the check from the man's fingers, Bill tore it in two overlapped the pieces and tore them in two again. Then he handed the pieces back. Sir, I don't want your money. What I do want is your faith to be firmly planted in Jesus Christ. The last person to be prayed for that night was a woman who hobbled along with difficulty. 
Her husband steadied her as she struggled up the steps to where Bill stood waiting. Grasping the woman's hand, Bill said, I don't feel any vibrations in you either. I have arthritis, the woman told him. Well, that explains it, said Bill. The vibrations come from germs. I can't feel your trouble because arthritis is caused by acid. Still, Jesus Christ can deliver you if you will believe he can. The gift he gave me does not heal. The gift is to raise people's faith. Jesus Christ is the only healer. As Bill prayed for this arthritic woman, her eyes glazed over and her muscles relaxed as though she had fallen into a trance. While the host pastor came to the microphone to dismiss the meeting, this woman stood in a daze, her eyes fixed on Bill as he staggered away from the podium and through the side door. A few days later, the husband of this woman begged his way to the door of Bill's hotel room. Bill invited him in. Brother Branham, you've never met me, but you met my wife in the prayer line earlier this week. She had arthritis, and she was the last person you prayed for that night. Yes, I remember her. How is she doing? Her arthritis seems to be getting better, but something else is wrong. She's talking like she's delirious. What do you mean? After you prayed for her, she was in a trance until we got home. The next morning she asked me, Who is that other man that came down with Brother Branham when he prayed for me? And I said, There was no other man. She said, Oh, yes, there was. He was a large man with dark skin and black hair hanging down near his shoulders. Brother Branham, what is she talking about? You were all alone on the platform. Bill knew she had seen the angel of the Lord, but he didn't want to say so just yet. Sir, have you or your wife ever been in my meetings before or heard me tell my story? No, we've never heard of you until this week. I see. Tell me more about this other man your wife saw on the platform with me. What did he do? Bill's visitor fidgeted as though worried his story would sound incredible. She said she saw this man looking down on you while you were praying for her. When you finished, this man looked at my wife and said, You have come for healing. Don't worry. Brother Branham's prayer will be answered and you will be healed. Then this man looked back at you and said to my wife, Doesn't Brother Branham look thin and frail? But he'll be strong again after a while. Then when you left, she watched this man walk right out the side door with you. Brother Branham, I was there too. I know that you and my wife were the only ones standing there. What do you make of it? Soberly, Bill explained, That's the angel of the Lord that appears to me. I'm glad you came and told me this. I'm so tired and worn out. It's good to know I'll be all right after a while.